where I'm reading from now, continues this uh, teaching about the little mind which Sri Aurobindo is giving us in this canto. In the bright kingdoms of the rising sun, all is a birth into a power of light. All here deformed guards there its happy shape. Here all is mixed and marred. There pure and whole. Yet each is a passing step, a moment's phase. Awake to a greater truth beyond her acts, the mediatrix sat and saw her works and felt the marvel in them and the force but knew the power behind the face of time. She did the task, obeyed the knowledge given. Her deep heart yearned towards great ideal things, and from the light looked out to wider light. A brilliant hedge drawn round her, narrowed her power. Faithful to her limited sphere she toiled, but knew its highest, widest seeing was a half-search, its mightiest acts a passage or a stage. For not by reason was creation made, and not by reason can the truth be seen, which through the veils of thought, the screens of sense, hardly the spirit's vision can descry. Dimmed by the imperfection of its means. The little mind is tied to little things. Its sense is but the spirit's outward touch, half waked in a world of dark inconscience. It feels out for its beings and its forms, like one left fumbling in the ignorant night. In this small mold of infant mind and sense, desire is a child heart's cry, crying for bliss. Our reason only a toy's artificer, a rule maker in a strange stumbling game. But she, her dwarf aids knew, whose confident sight a bounded prospect took for the far goal. The world she has made is an interim report of a traveler towards the half-found truth in things, moving twixt nescience and nescience. For nothing is known while aught remains concealed. The truth is known only when all is seen. Attracted by the all that is the one, she yearns 
towards a higher light than hers. Hid by her cults and creeds, she has glimpsed God's face. She knows she has but found a form, a robe, but ever she hopes to see him in her heart and feel the body of his reality. As yet, a mask is there and not a brow. Although sometimes two hidden eyes appear, reason cannot tear off that glimmering mask. Her efforts only make it glimmer more. In packets she ties up the indivisible. Finding her hands too small to hold vast truth. She breaks up knowledge into alien parts or peers through cloud wreck for a vanished sun. She sees, not understanding what she has seen, through the locked visages of finite things, the myriad aspects of infinity. One day, the face must burn out through the mask. Our ignorance is wisdom's chrysalis. Our error weds new knowledge on its way. Its darkness is a blackened knot of light. Thought dances hand in hand with nescience on the grey road that winds towards the sun. Even while her fingers fumble at the knots which bind them to their strange companionship, into the moments of their married strife, sometimes break flashes of the enlightening fire. Even now, great thoughts are here that walk alone. Armed they have come with the infallible word in an investiture of intuitive light that is a sanction from the eyes of God. Announcers of a distant truth, they flame, arriving from the rim of eternity. A fire shall come out of the infinitude a greater gnosis shall regard the world, crossing out of some far omniscience on lustrous seas from the still wrapped alone, to illumine the deep heart of self and things, a timeless knowledge it shall bring to mind its aim to life, to ignorance its close. These last few lines are one of Sri Aurobindo's great reassurances and promises and prophecies to us. And with that promise, um, he closes the section on these three beings of the little mind. You know? um, 
the life, the, the physical mind, the life mind of desire and reason, which we have been reading about over the last pages. So before the end of the class, we will go right to the end of the canto. But for now, I'll go back and uh, explain these lines from the middle of page 256. He speaks first of all of the bright kingdoms of the rising sun. This is taking us back to the beginning of the canto where Sri Aurobindo uh, uh, shows us the little mind emerging as a rising sun. So he says, in those kingdoms, the bright kingdoms of the rising sun, the emergence of mind. In the bright kingdoms of the rising sun, all is a birth into a power of sight, of light. That's what is happening. Uh, the development of mind is the birth into a power of light, which is mind. He says that everything which is deformed here, which is twisted and obscure, keeps there in that bright kingdom of the rising sun, it keeps its happy shape its undeformed shape. Here in our world, everything is mixed up and marred, spoiled, damaged. But there, it is pure and whole. And yet each movement there is only a passing step, a moment's phase. It is not something lasting and permanent. He speaks about the power who is overseeing this emergence. Here he speaks of her as the mediatrix, the goddess who mediates between the heights and the depths. She is sitting and seeing her works, all that she's done bringing into manifestation these three beings. And she feels the marvel in them and the force. But she knows that there's a greater power hidden behind the face of time. In time, something much greater is going to emerge. But for the time being, she just does the work that she has been given. She did the task. She obeyed the knowledge given. In her heart, in her deep heart, that power is yearning towards great ideal things, much higher than the development of mind as the ideal. She is looking out from this little light that she's been given out to wider light. But it's as if a limit has been set around her power a brilliant hedge. It's a very shining, beautiful hedge, perhaps with thorns. It's encircling her. It keeps her power within narrow bounds. But she remains faithful to this limited sphere of action that she's given. Faithful to her limited sphere she toiled. But she knows that even its highest and widest seeing, its highest and widest power of vision, is only a half search. It isn't strong enough to find out things fully. Even its mightiest acts, its greatest achievements, are only a passage or a stage. And this is because of the inherent limitations of reason itself. Not by reason 
was creation made. And not by reason can the truth be seen, that truth which it's so difficult even for the spirit to see, that reason which through the veils of thought, the screens of sense, hardly the spirit's vision can describe. Dimmed by the imperfection of its means. And here he mentions these, the means of mind. It's the power of thought and the power of sense, the senses, what the knowledge that can come to us through our senses. You know. So through those powers of thought and sense, even the spirit has difficulty in looking through them because these means of thought and sense are insufficient, they're imperfect. They can never give us the full picture. This little mind which is emerging now in the story of things, it's tied to little things, it's restricted. Its sense, what it can sense, is only the outward truth of the spirit. It's only half wakened up in this world of dark inconscience. This world which is dominated by matter and the deep trance of matter. Mm -hmm. The little mind feels out, it tries, gropes to feel for its beings and its forms just like somebody stumbling about in the darkness, like one left fumbling in the night of ignorance. And in this small mold, this little mind that's given, this infant mind and infant sense, in this stage, desire, it's like a child's heart crying for bliss, for ananda, for happiness. And our reason is a toy's artificer. It's like a toy maker who provides this infant mind with playthings. Our reason is a rule maker in a strange, stumbling game. It's trying to set rules and give us directions. But she, this means this power, who's been given the task of giving birth to the little mind in the evolutionary process. She, her dwarf aids knew that is, these three powers of hers. She knows who they are, what they can do, their limitation. Hmm? Those uh, powers are very sure of themselves. They have, their sight is confident, but they're mistaking this very limited prospect, this very limited which they, uh, field in which they can work and learn, she takes that for the far goal, for the great distant achievement. But this world which she has made, the goddess of the little mind, is only an interim report. It's not giving us the whole picture. It's something on the way. It's an interim report of one who is traveling towards the half-found truth in things. And necessarily, that traveler is moving between nescience and nescience. One kind of not knowing of ignorance and another. Because, the poet tells us, Nothing is really known, 
while anything remains concealed, if anything is hidden and uh, unknown, we can't have the whole picture. Mm -hmm. The truth is known only when all is seen. But that power, that mediatrix, is attracted by the all that is the one. She's yearning for, longing for, aspiring for a higher light than her own. Hidden by her cults and creeds, the cults and creeds of the little mind, she has seen beyond that. She has glimpsed God's face. She knows that she has only found a form, a robe, a partial knowledge. But she's aspiring for something more. Ever she hopes to see him in her heart and feel the body of his reality. So far as yet, it's only, or what she sees is only a mask. She can't see that brow full of light. Sometimes two hidden eyes appear, they look through the mask. But reason can't tear off that glimmering mask, that mask which is giving off a faint light. Her efforts, her attempts to go deeper and see a higher truth only make it glimmer a little bit more, a little bit more brightly. And how does she deal? How is she able to deal with the knowledge that she can uh, approach? It says, uh, she ties up the indivisible in packets. She has to cut things up and divide them. It's one of the great um, characteristics of our analytic mind. No? Because her hands are too small to hold vast truth. She has to do that. She breaks up knowledge into alien parts, separate parts. Or then he likens her uh, attempts to looking through cloud rack for a vanished sun the sun of truth, of total awareness and knowledge. She has to look through cloud rack. Cloud rack means when the sky is covered by many moving clouds, like we see sometimes before a storm. She sees, not understanding what she has seen, through the locked visages of finite things, the myriad aspects of infinity. She sees something. She sees, in fact, many, many different aspects of the infinite truth, but she's not able to recognize them for what they are. She sees, not understanding what she has seen, through the locked visages, as if they are locked doors that we can't see behind, hmm? of these finite things. All these are, in fact, aspects of infinity. One day, the poet promises us, the face, the face of truth must burn out through this mask of appearances. Our state of ignorance is wisdom's chrysalis. A chrysalis is a stage in the development of an insect. First there will be the egg and out of the egg will hatch caterpillar perhaps, and then the caterpillar spins for itself a cocoon, and then it will break out of the cocoon as a butterfly. 
So, our ignorance is a stage like that in our development. Uh, our ignorance is the chrysalis. It's going to give birth to wisdom. Our error, all the mistakes that we make, marries new knowledge on its way. There's all this darkness of our ignorance. But Sri Aurobindo tells us this is like a very dense, blackened knot of light. And he shows us thought, thought dancing hand in hand with nescience, as if they are two friends. And the thought and the nescience are dancing hand in hand, and they are moving together on that gray road that's winding towards the sun of perfect vision and knowledge. So even while the, fing the, the fingers of that goddess, of that power, are fumbling, trying to undo the knots which bind these two together, this uh, thought and nescience, she's trying to separate them, binding them to their strange companionship because they're quarreling. They're like a married couple who are quarreled, quarreling. But the poet says, into the moments of their married strife, of their quarreling, sometimes break flashes of the enlightening fire that will give true knowledge between the strife of thought and nescience, or the struggle between thought and nescience. And he tells us that even now, great thoughts are here that walk alone. We find many of these great thoughts in this poem. Those great thoughts that walk alone, they have come into the human world armed with the infallible word, the word that cannot but be victorious and effective. They've been given an investiture, a kind of robe of intuitive light, the light that comes from that high level of consciousness, the intuition. And that investiture, that robe they've been given these great thoughts. It is a sanction from the eyes of God. God has said yes to them. Those great thoughts come as announcers of a distant truth. They flame arriving from the rim of eternity. They come to us from the transcendent realm. A fire shall come out of the infinitudes. A great agnosis shall regard the world, crossing out of some far omniscience on lustrous seas from the still wrapped alone to illumine the deep heart of self and things. That great agnosis shall bring to mind a timeless knowledge, its aim to life, to ignorance, its close. It's only a few lines, but what a wonderful um, promise from the Lord. So now we have this last short section with which uh, Sri Aurobindo closes this canto. Above, above these three, 
this dwarfish trinity of the little mind. Above, in a high, breathless stratosphere. A stratosphere, that's the outermost um, layer of our Earth atmosphere. Very rarefied. We can't breathe up there. Above, in a high, breathless stratosphere, overshadowing that dwarfish trinity of the little mind, there are two greater beings, lived aspirants to a limitless beyond, captives of space, walled by the limiting heavens, in the unceasing circuit of the hours, yearning for the straight paths of eternity, and from their high station looked down on this world, two sun-gazed demons witnessing all that is. And then he describes the two demons. First, a power to uplift the laggard world, imperious road, a huge, high-winged life thought, unwont to tread the firm, unchanging soil, accustomed to a blue infinity, it planed in sunlit sky and starlit air. It saw afar the unreached immortal's home and heard afar the voices of the gods. Iconoclast and shatterer of time's forts, overleaping limit and exceeding norm, it lit the thoughts that glow through the centuries and moved to acts of superhuman force. As far as its self-winged airplanes could fly, visiting the future in great brilliant raids, it reconnoitered vistas of dream fate. Apt to conceive, unable to attain, it drew its concept maps and vision plans too large for the architecture of mortal space. Beyond, in wideness where no footing is, an imagist of bodiless ideas, impassive to the cry of life and sense, a pure thought mind surveyed the cosmic act. Archangel, of a white, transcending realm. It saw the world from solitary heights, luminous in a remote and empty air. So let's look at these two sun-gazed demons. One of them is a huge, high-winged, Life thought. It has all the dynamism of the life force. Hmm? Shobindo shows both these spirits on a very high level, but maybe the life thought comes first. Hmm? It, it can look into the future. It saw afar the unreached immortal's home and heard afar the voices of the gods. And the great service that it does to humanity, 
is that it's an iconoclast. It's a destroyer. It um, shatters the th things that are established in time. It's not, uh, it's just able to leap over all limits and norms. Its power is to light the thoughts that glow through the centuries and that move human beings towards acts of superhuman force, leading us to exceed ourselves. It looks into the future as far as its self-winged airplanes could fly. It visits the future in great brilliant raids and it's reconnoitering, it's exploring like a scout vistas of dream fate in the far future. It's able to conceive this mind. It has these great dreams and visions but it's unable to attain. It can't achieve those uh, glorious possibilities which it sees. But it's preparing these concept maps and vision plans. They are too large, too developed for the architecture of mortal space. It's something for the future, for the immortals to achieve. And the other one is this pure thought mind, which is looking at everything that's going on in the universe. It is an imagist of ideas. Here, perhaps the, the term idea with a capital I, it's referring to concepts which are uh, achieved on a very, very high level of, uh, of consciousness, which can be realized later with much difficulty on the lower levels. It doesn't pay any attention to the cries, our cries of life and sense. It's looking at what's going on in the cosmos, seeing the world from these solitary heights. It's an archangel with great protecting wings. It sees the world from high, high, high above, luminous in a remote and empty air. Perhaps King Aswapati, we shall see in ahead, uh, is able to rise to these heights himself. The first question was about a word that um, comes at the bottom of page 256. So the word descry is not very familiar. It means to be able to uh, make out. You look with difficulty and you, perhaps in the distance, somebody is there, you think it might be a friend, you're not sure, you can't descry uh, who it is. So here he's making a similar um, point that there are reasons why the vision of the spirit cannot descry the truth. It cannot see the truth because um, its vision is dimmed by the imperfection of its means, the means which it has in this uh, realm of reason. The spirit cannot describe the truth. Definitely not by reason. The 
then a little further on, also in the same passage about reason. So this word ought, A-U-G-H-T, is also unfamiliar. No? It means anything. So what the poet is saying, that we can't know anything truly as long as anything remains hidden. The truth is known only when all is seen. It needs an integral vision that can see everything. Only then we can grasp something of the truth. Then, further on, on page 258, line 722 to 725, those great thoughts have come into our human consciousness. They have come armed, clothed, with an infallible word. They've come from a great height. They've been clothed, they've been given a kind of uniform, an investiture of intuitive light. And that uniform, that investiture, is a sanction from the eyes of God. The question was about this word, sanction, which is rather a strange word because it has two meanings which are directly opposite to each other. Here, the sanction from the eyes of God, the Lord has looked at these thoughts and said yes to them. But of course, in the newspapers and on TV, we hear about sanctions being applied against this or that company or country. And then it means that we are uh, blocking them. We, are, we don't want to trade with them. We don't want to have anything to do with them. So, <laughs> sanction, it means both these things. Here, it is positive. It means the eyes of God have looked at these great thoughts and said yes to them. And then we come to the last short section of Canto 10. And I'm going to explain that again in full. In the first part of the canto, we read about these three powers of mind. The dwarfish physical mind, the wild and uncontrollable life mind, and the reason. So here it says that above them, above them in a high, breathless stratosphere, the stratosphere is the outermost layer of the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, for us it would be impossible to breathe there. That's why he uses this word, breathless. There are these <coughs> two demons with a capital D. <coughs> it's a Greek word, ancient Greek word. It's of course connected with the word demon. But while a demon we think of as a bad spirit, these demons were perhaps considered as guiding spirits. The great um, ancient Greek philosopher Socrates uh, said that he was guided by his inner demon. And it told him very simple things, whether to turn right or left at the crossroads, 
but it also guided him in other ways. So these are guiding spirits. They are overshadowing these three little powers of mind. They are aspiring to a limitless beyond, but they are still captives of space. So they are still part of our manifestation. They are walled by limiting heavens. They can't escape into the straight paths of eternity. But that's what they are aspiring for, these two spirits. And from their high station, from the levels where they are, they are looking down on this world. That's a general description of both of them. He calls them two sun gaze demons. So this adjective, sun gaze, it suggests that they can look directly at the sun as eagles are supposed to be able to do. That they, so they, he likens them to eagles, that these beings are flying very, very high and looking directly at the sun and their eyes are not dazzled by the powerful sunlight. And then uh, the poet describes each of them separately. The first one, he, he says, is a power to uplift the laggard world. To uplift, to lift up the laggard world, this world which is not progressing quickly enough, fast enough. A laggard is somebody who is hanging behind, not keeping up with things. So the first one is a power to uplift the laggard world. And he says it is imperious. It has a powerful view. A huge, high-winged life thought. This is quite different from that uh, life mind that we read about earlier in the canto, which was Uh, out of control, but nevertheless had its purpose and its usefulness. This is a huge, high-winged life thought, unwont to tread the firm, unchanging soil. So the question was about the word unwont, If you want to do something, you do it habitually, every day or every week, as we are wont to meet here on Thursday afternoons. This is not used, this power is not used to treading the firm, unchanging soil. It doesn't set foot on our earth. It is flying with its huge wings far above us. It is accustomed to a blue infinity, a limitless space. And it's planing there like condors or vultures or other very big birds. They, they sail up on the currents of hot air and they get high up and there they plane without moving their wings at all. It planed in sunlit sky and starlit air. It saw afar. Because it's so high up, it can see a great distance. It saw afar the unreached 
immortal's home and heard afar the voices of the gods. Then the poet describes this demon further. He says it's an iconoclast and shatterer of time's thoughts. An iconoclast is one who destroys things that people believe in. Things that they consider sacred and unchangeable, the iconoclast comes and uh, destroys them. So this spirit is destroying the way that things are. It's a shatterer of time's thoughts, of those strong established uh, habits and ways. It is overleaping limit, all boundaries, and exceeding norm. Norms are the normal standards that we rely on. It goes beyond those. So it's a wonderful image, these self-winged airplanes, its own wings, as far as they could fly. It goes visiting the future, the future of the earth. In great brilliant raids it goes and into the future and brings things back. And it also is reconnoitering vistas of dream fate. To reconnoiter, this is a kind of military term, the old armies which went on foot used to send out ahead of them uh, scouts also on foot to find out what was lying ahead where there might be a good place to mount an attack is there a river are there some woods are there obstacles to reconnoiter it goes ahead and sees what is there so what it is reconnoitering, what it's looking for, is vistas, long views, long perspectives of dream fate, of what might be in the distant future. The poet says that that demon that high-winged life thought is apt to conceive, unable to attain. This is a kind of state of the mind which is able to have great visions for the future but is not able to find the way to fulfill them. It's apt, it's, uh, it's competent, to conceive these great dreams of the future, but it's not able to attain them, not able to achieve them. But what it does, it draws maps, concept maps, and vision plans for achieving those uh, great achievements of the future. No? But those maps and plans are too large for the ar architecture of mortal space. They belong to much higher realms that won't be achieved until the future. That is that first one, this huge high-winged life thought. And just as there are beings who seem to embody the powers of the first three small beings, 
Perhaps there are beings, even human beings, who to some extent embody the qualities of this high-winged life thought. And then the second one. So above the level of this dwarf trinity, there are these two much greater beings. They don't touch ground. First comes the life thought, and even above that is this pure thought mind, which is able to make a survey, to look and encompass everything that is happening in the universe, the cosmic act. He describes it as a kind of archangel. We know what angels are, divine messengers, but archangels are the, the highest ones in the hierarchy. So this, this being occupies a white transcending realm which goes beyond our universe. It's able to survey the cosmos from where it stands. It saw the world from solitary heights. It's living up there, luminous in that remote and empty air. It's interesting to me that uh, Sri Aurobindo has included these two spirits in the canto which is about the little mind. Hmm? <laughs> they obviously belong to an in-between uh, space which is, has nothing to do with the little mind which is far above but which perhaps is not yet um, the greater mind uh, as an exception uh, we can listen to mother's voice reading some of these lines accompanied by Sunilda's beautiful music Let's close like that. Thanks to Sri Aurobindo and the mother. Overshadowing the dwarfish trinity lived aspirants to limitless beyond. Two sun gaze demons witnessing all that is. A power to uplift the leathered world, imperious rolled a huge high-winged life sought beyond in wideness where no footing is. A pure thought mind surveyed the cosmic act, archangel of a white transcending ring. It saw the world from solitary height.